Now we're thrilled to be joined by Therese Marie Mayet. Therese is from Seabird uh, Island Band. Her work has appeared in Guernica, Guardian, Mother Jones, Medium, Al Jazeera, and the Los, An the Los Angeles Times and Best American Essays. She is the New York Times bestselling author of Heart Berries, which was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award for English Language Nonfiction. Emma Watson selected the book for our shared book, uh, our shared shelf book club, and it was also chosen for the New York Times slash PBS NewsHour book club. Heartberries was listed as a best book of the year by NPR Library Journal, the New York Public Library, Chicago Public Library, and Harper's Bazaar. Therese is the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award and the Spalding Prize for the promotion of peace and justice in literature. She teaches at Purdue University. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's wonderful to have you with us. Um, you've written about the long-term effects of experiencing trauma as a child, and we wanted to invite you on because early last month, the Surgeon General issued an urgent advisory regarding youth mental health and the American Academy of Pediatrics you know, considers this an emergency. And at this very moment, we're seeing record numbers of young children sick and sometimes hospitalized with the virus. And of course, many of these kids are kids who are too young for vaccination. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you've seen children's situation evolve since the beginning of the pandemic, which was, oh my God, all the way back in March, 2020. Yeah, I mean, even birthdays are something significant to mourn a little. My son, you know, the last two birthdays, he's not, you know, had a party. He doesn't know what those look like. And um, we, they're very quiet and small and it's a cake. And I mean, it's something to mourn that's very small, you know, and also, we didn't leave the house, you know, the first year, we didn't take him anywhere. And um, when he was going to school in Zoom, he, I mean, he's a gifted kid, you know, but I think it was a disservice to have him in front of a computer screen, but it was also a disservice to try to learn during a time where we were checking CNN for a death toll. You know what I mean? Like it's hard to um, splinter your efforts as a mother when it comes to protection and education. And I think we should have been able to focus on just protecting our children, you know? We should have just been focused on giving them a safe environment and explaining daily because daily things were changing what was gonna happen next, you know? Yeah, it was really difficult. He had to, uh, we had to bring our basset hound to his classes and we, <laughs> he brought the laptop in a tent and the dog would sit next to him and that's the only way he'd go and do it. And um, he, he was super gifted. So he knew all the content that they were teaching. And, um, but what he didn't understand is why, why was it on a computer? when he had seen all these dog movies, especially, or cartoons where kids are going to school, um, like nothing's wrong and there was no way to compartmentalize it and no digestible you know, cartoon or TV show we could show him that showed what, um, not only what illness looked like and what COVID was, but also what the measures were and why we couldn't just go to a park you know, the first year. Yeah. How, how old is your son? He's seven. He turned seven on the eighth. <laughs> oh, happy yeah. birthday. Yeah. And you like wanted a dance party. And I'm like, that's just not possible, you know? And I know for some parents it could be, and I wouldn't fault them because I know what we've been through. I can't really judge anybody right now, you know? And I knew people, even when things were going on at first who were like, I'm going crazy, I'm gonna to go to Vegas, you know? And I was like, well, that's not smart. And then that person um, ended up taking their own life, you know, before they went to Vegas. And I kind of wish they had, you know, I kind of wish they went to Vegas instead of being alone in their apartment because they were isolated, you know, in Minnesota. And, um, or was it Minnesota? I think it was Turtle Lake, I think it's, Minneapolis I don't know states that well because I'm super Canadian but yeah yeah and I was like man I wish I wish they had just went to Vegas and might have um, prolonged their life you know 
Yeah. It's an incredibly sad story. I feel like some of what you're talking about in relation to time is it's one thing to tell an adult to kind of hang in there to some unspecified future moment when things will be better, but it's really hard to provide that context for children. And it's also different developmentally to, um, pull back on the quality of education for a five or six year old whose brain is developing and will develop in a certain way, whether there's a pandemic or not, because because they're growing, like that growing isn't going to, isn't going to take a pause. And, you know, if you miss certain things during those time periods, you it's, it's not the same thing as someone who's 32 missing things because I mean, not that, yeah. I mean, you're just growing in a different way and at a different speed and, and how can you, parents have had a really hard job during this time. And I think maybe kids have had an even harder one. Yeah, they don't understand and they shouldn't have to, you know, and that's what protection is about. You're supposed to be able to protect them from things they, they don't understand yet. And, you know, I think in a lot of situations, you know, I mean, I had the luxury of, you know, I own, I was able to visit my, my, um, my ex's parents with the baby so that um, they could all have holidays together. I forget when, but we literally got a porta potty, little porta potty for our kid. At the time he was like, you know, really, really young, but so that he wouldn't have to go into gas stations to use the restroom. And we drove to Colorado. It was like, I don't know, 12 hours or something. And that was the only time we visited family. And it was like, it felt so weird because um, we got tests before and after and we isolated and everything. And I just wanted him to see his grandparents um, because I didn't know, you know, what the future held. That was the only time I did something risky, you know, and I feel like for the baby, it wasn't even scary because by then he was just impressed to be in the van for longer than an hour because he hadn't seen the outside. Like he hadn't seen the highways, he hadn't seen mountains, he hadn't seen the outdoors. Um, He'd seen like our cul-de-sac area. And I think that's just really surreal. And it's not super unfortunate because my situation is really blessed. Like we're middle-class here, you know? Um, So I can't imagine what it's like to be who I was maybe 10 years ago, which is like a server um, with a baby. You know what I mean? Like imagine that type of exposure and also um, being dependent on tips and not being able to isolate really, you know, to make a living. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, we're thinking about what will the mental health effects of this pandemic be in five or 10 years is one of the things we're trying to talk about here. And I'm really concerned about what that's going to look like for the kids who have lived through this, even in a middle-class environment, and but especially who are worse off, you know, in five or 10 years, how that affects people developmentally. I mean, that, those, those are changes that accumulate, you know, and then add up. And suddenly you have a generation of kids who were educated differently or not as well, or who didn't receive some of the normal developmental opportunities that they should have had, you know? Yeah. Like having my five, I think he was five, like use a little porta potty in the back of a van while we didn't look that's developmentally gonna mess them up I'm just kidding like we did the exact thing we bought a little tent (laughs) and like and had a and and like crapped in like a five gallon paint jug you know yeah that's not right to go visit to go see my sister who was in California and we drove and met in Wyoming you know these are crazy I remember this because yeah, yeah. I, I think I I think I called you, Whitney, and was like, I want to go to a place. How do I do a thing? And you were like, I can tell you. <laughs> and then we had this like, I was like, this You're is like, you know, yeah. podcast behind the scenes, like this horror of like how to figure out all of the, how to how to kind of MacGyver all of these solutions to try and give your kid like a, a normal space and a normal time. Yeah. And none of us got COVID, which I'm so thankful for. You know, and my baby is vaccinated. We're all vaccinated now. I'm boosted you know, his uncles boosted, like we're all in a okay position, but we, the only person, the person who's most vulnerable is my seven-year-old, you know, cause we don't know the long-term effects. And we also, it, now it's more susceptible for children, I believe, right? Like children are getting it more. And that's just what we're hearing at the preschool. So it's like, I don't know. It's just very unfortunate. And I, you know, had tuberculosis when I was six. And I remember that was such an essential time in my life. And 
you know, being hospitalized for a long period of time and having like my, um, you know, tubes in my lungs and, and things like that. And um, it was really traumatic for me, um, not only because I knew that I could have died, but also because, you know, I was never going to, um, I, I missed so much school that when I came back, I didn't, you know, even know myself in terms of, of um, I was behind and I also, my social group was different, you know? And I just, I think about that and I think like, you know, it's, it's stories like that, like that worry me. And I just, I don't want my baby to get sick, you know, because I feel like we're all kind of unhealthy <laughs> after COVID. Like we don't do as much as we used to. I don't do as much physically as I used to. And, you know, I, I used to go for long walks with my baby all the time. And we used to go to the park all the time. And now it's a special thing we do. And we take a lot of measures, you know? There's also a concept of co-regulation, which is a psychological concept. And, and for kids, it can apply to them. Like it, it's a way of being together. Human beings generally reduce each other's anxiety, you know, and kids in a, who are together in a classroom can reduce each other's anxiety about things. And, and but if they're doing online learning separately, um, that isn't happening, right? That sort of reduction, that ability for the group to help out the individual is not allowed. I've noticed it in my my son, who though he's going to school in person, like my youngest son, who's 12, he has developed a hat. He is, he, he feels most, it's like a blanket, like sitting with his iPad and his earphones on and watching the Simpsons, which he's already watched every single episode during the entire pandemic. So that's over 400 episodes of the Simpsons, right? Oh my God. So for whatever reason, this is what is calming him down, but it would be his friends who he can't like play with normally. You know, and I think that's bad. I don't, I don't know how to fix it, but I don't think that's I mean, good for him. Development. My mind. friends were in The Simpsons when I was twelve, so <laughs> I mean, I didn't have a. Pandemic. There's worse friends than The Simpsons, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I wonder if you, we want to have you read from Heartberries, and we thought you could maybe read to us a passage about your own experiences with mental health. It's funny because it's one of the books in my stag. I <laughs> can't find it. Hold it's on. Be, it's being used in the recording. Yeah, hold on. Okay. Cool. The group counselor said that one must forgive for oneself and not for the perpetrator. This made little to no sense in my mind. We're all on meds here. Most of us are half zombie, half antsy, a weird mix. In white culture, forgiveness is synonymous with letting go. In my culture, I believe we carry pain until we can reconcile with it through ceremony. Pain is not framed like a problem with a solution. I don't even know that white people see transcendence the way we do. I'm not sure that their dichotomies apply to me. I found myself staring off during group, which made my counselor, Terry, prompt me for my story. I look for external validations of worth, and I always end up crazy over it, I said. It's good you can acknowledge that, Terry said. How long have you been doing that? My whole life. Isn't that what we learn as children? To look for affirmations and the external, our fathers, our mothers, I said. Some children are taught self-esteem from a young age. Oh, I said. There's a girl with tight braids who posts up against the wall at group therapy. When Terry asks her to sit down, she says she doesn't want to. She says that she has to be here for seven full days, no matter if she behaves or not. Terry explains self-esteem and its function. And I blame my mother for not saying these things. My mother wasn't big on self-esteem for herself, let alone trying to foster that in me. I think self-esteem is a white invention to further separate one person from another. It asks people to assess their values and implies people have worth. It seems like identity capitalism. Mom did teach me story along with Grandpa Crow. She knew that was my power and she knew women needed their power honed early before it's beaten out of them by the world. I know what you're thinking, Casey, again, with my mother. 
Yes, unfortunately, that's the biggest part of my work in this place. The therapist seemed to think she's a link to my betterment. I think she did the best she could with the tool she had. The therapist said, that's making excuses. Sometimes she had to lock herself away from the world, that's all. I have fond and bitter memories of her. I can't imagine what she'd think of me being here. My mother would have laughed at me. She'd have rolled her head in laughter and thrown her head back at my misery. She believed in subversion and turning things upside down. She mocked everything. My desire to be normal or sincere made her laugh. Men will never love you, she said once. They'll use you up and when you're bone dry and it's your time to write, you'll be alone without a goddamn typewriter to your name. She had a lot of things taken from her. False starts took something out of her and then having children and getting married and then divorced, all the jobs she had. And then there was the work at her desk and the several books she wrote. I feel like my body is being drawn through a syringe. Sometimes walking is hard. The gravity of Indian women's situations and the weight of our bodies are too much. Even mom's cynicism was subversive. She often said nothing would work out. She often said that trying was futile and still dedicated her life to other people through social work. When she was unemployed, she rallied for social justice. She did things that required hopefulness. She made a name as an angry Indian woman who could consent and disallow things. Indian women are usually discouraged from that basic agency. Not to say that she wasn't betrayed and hurt. Thank you so much. I really, um, that passage is, I think, one of the most moving ones for me in, in reading your book. Um, and in that passage, you talk about how in your culture, quote, pain is not framed like a problem with a solution. And a little bit earlier in the book, you write about kind of in the Indian belief in surviving, but not necessarily dubbing that resilience. And I kind of thought about those two things as more realistic than thinking about kind of dressing up the problem or solving it. Um, like resilience sounds pretty, but it's not necessarily um, pleasant or accurate. And sometimes pain is a problem that you can't solve. And one kind of pain it seems to me like that we're going to have going forward is that children should have been able to trust adults. That is to say like my generation or your generation to manage the pandemic responsibly. Mm -hmm. And that failure is a really intense betrayal and trauma and it's a generational trauma. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you think we can address this with our children or talk about it. Well, you know, I think for my baby, like we learned to believe in things beyond ourselves just in the past year. So like I was not, you know, practicing my culture very much within the marriage I was in. And it was, you know, like an eight year marriage and I didn't go to ceremony and I didn't pray and I didn't smudge because I always felt like it was a spectacle to my white partner who would watch. Right. And like it almost seemed like they were taking notes for their novel. So I never did it. And then now in my own space, like my baby and I, he has a medicine bundle uh, with a little medicine in it that protects him at night. And he also has, um, you know, he likes to smudge, which is it, just sage and kinnikinnik and women's medicine mostly. And we burn it and we clean ourselves and we pray and we give thanks for what we have. And like as a practice, giving thanks every day has made him feel more safe, you know, that we have things to protect and also asking for some protection beyond ourselves is important. And um, for us, like reconciling with our pain through ceremony, I think it can also happen in writing. You can encourage your children to write about this time and keep a journal of their uncertainties and the things that they don't know yet or the things that they've witnessed, you know, in school that have changed, um, like they can't sit together in a lunchroom, like, how does that make them feel? You know, how does it make them feel that they can't sit as close? Um, my baby before, 
you know, when he was in daycare, he liked to talk right in people's faces and they used to hold each other and laugh and roll around. And it's like that kind of play um, is limited now, you know? And it's like, how do you mourn those things? And I mourn things through writing about them and through remembrance. And I also think we should write about our children too. And I don't think, you know, you need to do it for the public, but you can do it for them, for their personal history, you know? And I think that's one measure. And I also think um, valuing the idea of safety and understanding that you should be uh, full of generosity and grace to other people, um, almost first and foremost as, as like an act of collectivism. And I think we personally, you know, our government might, might not be able to protect us and they might not be taking measures they should to protect teachers specifically, but we can do our best. We can give K95 masks to our teachers. We can, you know, we can do a lot of things and we can also um, do our best to protect our neighbors too. And we can limit our interactions and limit how we leave the house. And I think that's the hardest thing for me is because, you know, I don't have um, any, you know, since I'm boosted, I feel pretty safe, right? I feel like, oh man, like if I want to, you know, I don't know. Actually, I don't want to do anything. I don't like leaving the house anymore. <laughs> like I love I, that I, idea. Yeah, go ahead. Of reconciling pain through ceremony. Um, I was thinking a lot about that. My like great grandmother died in the 1918 pandemic. And I didn't find that out until like this year because it was never spoken of. It was not, rec it was not reconciled. That pain was not reconciled through ceremony. Um, and I hope in five or 10 years, I, I will, I would like to try to find a way we don't, you know, maybe invent a ceremony for my kids or my family of reconciling what we have been through during this time. I think, you know, that's the, what you're describing sounds really wonderful. And that's coming out of your own, you know, personal, uh, you know, history um, and culture. Do yeah. you think there'll be a national reconciliation in some way? We can find ceremonies as a, as oh. a people uh, collectively yeah. to, to reconcile in that way. I think the government loves monuments to things they could have stopped. <laughs> you know, like, That's not on. a good kind of ceremony. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, but I'm like, talking like one that yeah. would work. But I think, what does it mean if your grandmother had a journal, right? Like, what would it have meant, you yeah. know, to that if she was able to speak about her own life or, or how, is it your great grandmother? Or? That was my great grandmother. Yeah. yeah. You my know, grandfather's what mother. Yeah. And I think about that. I think, well, that's ceremony, that's memorial. Um, and that's a way. And so it's like, maybe if there's, you know, I know time capsules are beautiful, right? And like, they're collective, and they, you can do that as a family. And I oh, think, you know, idea. yeah, there's lots of things you can do to bring some type of um, hope, right, for the next year. Right. Even though I, I know for certain we will lose people. I lost two aunties last year, you know, and it, it doesn't feel the last two years have bled into each other. And I can't believe I lost two aunties last year and I lost two friends the year before, you know, it's just crazy to think about, you know. Yeah. In writing about like, mental, oh, go ahead, Suki. Oh, sorry. I just was going to say, I mean, so many of these ideas that you're offering up seem like ways to kind of return agency to children. I feel like one thing that I have struggled with is, and we talked about this a little bit in an earlier episode, wait, I don't know if you remember this, but sort of like Trump was so extraordinary in a bad way that like I found myself entering into a kind of rhetoric that with others, I would not condone, like sort of <laughs> turning to a kind of, um, at least I feel like a pretty. You mean justified... saying that the trip president was a fucking asshole every day around <laughs> yes. your kids, around the kids <laughs> right? That and then you're the, around, you're... right? And then the kids sort of like picking, like the like. I feel like I I talk to. I don't know that that um, my own kids, um, my step kids, are necessarily articulating things this way. Like, but I feel like there's such justifiable anger mm -hmm. from children towards adults that like they have done all of these things correctly, no fault yeah. of their own, so little control. And so much of what you're talking about is like returning agency or or um, finding agency for kids. But there's there's this huge, and it feels to me like a very righteous anger towards sort of like 
you adults are like a bunch of fuck ups. And I, I sort of like, you know, when I talk about it with them, I'm sort of like, oh yes, you know, the other adults or the government, but like, I don't know, I mean, I'm also no. part of that. Yeah, and my, so my baby is part of the gifted program, which like, I'm super proud of that. But he also doesn't listen because I taught him to question authority, you know, as a young indigenous boy. So I was in the, you know, the teacher conference and I was like, yeah, I I taught my baby to question authority because they were explaining how he hacked a computer when it was time to do the math um, quiz. And they were like, we don't know how he did it. And I, I, we were, mildly proud but we didn't want to let it on in our eyes so I was like well you know this is my fault because I taught him to question authority and the the dean she was like where's the line and I was like I don't know because it seems like you know a failure at every measure here you know in terms of like our government in in terms of you know all authority I think you know even at Purdue right like you know, our university, um, it feels so surreal that we're going to be back in real time. And that I think, you know, it's very encouraged to be back in real time, but like, gosh, I, I don't even think we coped with the students grief of last year. Some students lost parents, you know what I mean? It's like, they're expected to come back. And, um, and some of them were living with their parents too and taking care of them. There was a lot of things that I feel like we haven't even processed all those things. And it's like, it, to act like we can keep going or that we should just, you know, not question the systems and powers that be and encourage our children to have the autonomy to know that like, yeah, you, you should be able to question things. And also you should be able to say no to things. Um, and it seems as though, cause you know, I didn't have the option of um, just taking him out of school, you know, for a year, but I would have. I would have done that. We should be allowed to do, these are unforeseen circumstances and they're completely different than anything um, even my mother's generation had to deal with in terms of illness, you know? We should be able to um, be more inventive and our quality of life um, should be better for everybody, not just for professors like myself or things like that. Like, I just feel like we're seeing a lot of disparity and we're seeing a lot of things that uh, children should be upset and they should be able to ask questions. And they also, um, they this kind of righteous anger always, it births something good in society, I think. It brings good things to the next generation, like a rowdiness that we needed, you know? And so I love that, um, that idea of rowdiness. And and you mentioned um, the loss of parents and, and in Heartberries, you also write about your father and his absence. Um, there was a major study done between 95 and 97, which um, with dug up as we were researching this and it focuses on adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and then their effect on adult outcomes and health. And the study really underlines that trauma in childhood years is formative and, and takes a toll on the body has manifest physically. And one major adverse childhood experience is identified as the loss of a parent, regardless of the reason. And as of June, it's estimated that more than 140,000 kids in the U.S. have lost a parent or grandparent caregiver to COVID is, you know, the students that you're talking about falling into that category also. And and that's happened and it's continuing to happen, obviously, Mm -hmm. on a massive scale. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how that affected you and, and what you think the kids of today will face as adults with that history. Right. I mean, I think for people of our generation, certainly there are people who have face that and have always faced that through unjust circumstances. But now the scale of this for this set of kids is so large. Yeah. I mean, just from a teacher's, you know, in my child's school, I feel like they're, they're giving more leniency to attendance issues, which I think is giving way to good things regarding how it was ableist to try to um, encourage students to have perfect attendance. And it was also classes. You know, there was no way that kids were going to have perfect attendance, you know, um, if they were coming from a situation that I grew up in or um, they had lost a parent and had to recoup and children should be encouraged to take time off when they're sick now, which, you know, before it was like, um, like my ex, if he had like a, if he was like dying sick when he was a kid, he used to talk about how his mom would just be like, no, you have to, she was an educator, you know? And I'm glad that we're in a new generation where like it's encouraged that you take that time. But with university specifically, I've seen professors become 
better people. You know, they're, they're not asking for, the ones I know at least, um, are not complaining as much about attendance and they're also not asking for um, proof, you know, as much, because um, it's hard to uh, get proof for these things, especially when they're happening in real time, you don't want to go into an office to get proof for something that you just, you should just be staying home, right? Um, so I think people, I hope people are better now that it's this massive um, thing where it's touched so many lives. I hope people are better and I hope people are encouraging and creating more accessibility. And I have seen more accessibility, especially with readings, you know, just the readings alone for, um, you know, students, my students, the undergrads and graduate students. Now they can attend from their own home and they can make pasta while they're, <laughs> and before they used to have to come and, schmooze with the writers and I I like the no real-time events I think it's better you know there's just a lot of things just in my own personal life but I don't know honestly I feel I feel a little um a little hopeless about things and because I know loss and I we're not giving um any attention to the grief like there's no grief component or trauma-informed learning in my son's school. And there's none of that in the academic space I work in. Like there's no concern for grief specifically. And I think that's something that I hope we'll have in the future to accommodate all of this loss, you know? I have a friend who teaches at Santa Clara who actually listens to this podcast. Um, and she sent me a syllabus um, and she had a wellness statement on it, which was so good. And so I just asked her if I could copy over, but a huge chunk of it is sort of like, feel free to take time to think about the circumstances in which you have to go to school, which are not fair. Yeah. And so I put, I started putting it on my syllabus and I realized like, there's nothing in sort of our classroom policies or our, our customs as educators are to sort of like point you to a PDF that tells you about, you know, um, the counseling center or the writing center or the sexual harassment policy, but there isn't sort of anything that's like a self-care policy. And she had sort of taken steps to develop this in a way that was so helpful and also so foreign to me. Like I was like, I was like, oh wait, I get to have a policy. Oh. Like, and I get yeah. to put it, you know, I can and I can put it in this way that is just as official as the rest of the institute. And I mean, of course, I don't know. I've always I have of course classroom policies, but the idea that um like promotion of wellness could be articulated in this way was so um was so useful to me. And I yeah, think like my, yeah my go ahead. has changed because last semester I went so easy on my students that they complained I was too easy. Cause like I was like, no, you do whatever you want. Like it's fine. Like, you know, in terms of the workshop or things like that. And uh it's funny because I was talking to um a student auditing my class. Her name was Miriam and we were talking about workshop in general. And I was telling her, oh, in my day, it was like top down and you just had to take the criticism and the tougher you were, the better you wrote. And she was like, yeah, you know, I'm glad my students told me they felt sorry for me for having that experience. And I was like, whoa, like that's what made me easier on my students. It's like, whoa, like we should change our pedagogy. We should be kinder as, as people because it doesn't make to be so rigid now makes no sense at all because nothing feels um, certain and nothing feels the same. And we have to adjust all of our learning and we should be more graceful and kind, I think, as a measure, you know, to ourselves and others. Yeah. But you're right that this sort of um, these terms and these actions are all individual. They're not coming from the institutions that we work for necessarily. Right. Yeah. They're not. I don't know, articulating policies of kindness that are specific or. Um, well, that like, idea that that she that you said about having classes on for for kids about how to deal with grief seems like in should be instituted immediately right now. And that's you essentially know. what's in the Surgeon General Advisory, right? Mm -hmm. The Surgeon General's Advisory about children's mental health says like we should be talking about this in school and at daycare yeah. centers and at community centers. We're definitely not doing it. We're not. And there's no learning component. Like, you know, we have, um, they learn how plants work. They learn how things work. And I think this question of COVID, it's like my, my dumb brother or my, 
not so great brother, sorry. Um, he was telling little Casey to put his mask on and Casey's like, why? And my brother is just, he, he didn't think about this. And he was like, well, you breathe in COVID and it'll go straight to your brain. <laughs> so my son wouldn't even have a window down while we were driving for like a week. And he's like, I just don't want it to go in my brain. And I was like, it's, that's not what's going to happen. <laughs> and we were trying to, so it's like, if there was a good way for them to learn about not only COVID itself, but also how to process the loss of birthday parties, right? Is that there, you can party, you know, in different ways or whatever, you know, it would be so cool to see these things um brought to kids in a way that they can at least visually see represented because right now there's no real visual even on tv about it that they can go to and see something familiar to their own daily experience right now i mean there are children's books about this there will be in five years i think yeah. you know uh, we can move faster i know we could though <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> In your writing, you talk about the effects of poverty, including how people talk about poverty. And the pandemic has driven people around the world into worse economic conditions. And while it's far from the high stakes matter, our small corner of the universe is being affected by this too. Funding for students is being cut or rearranged in certain ways. I wanted to ask uh, both of you what's going on at your respective universities in terms of student funding for your writing programs. Well, I mean, we don't have any graduate students for 2022-23. So like our classes are going to be drastically smaller for our graduate classes. And um, I think our program, you know, I think the humanities in general, uh, you know, they're not so fond of here at our school. They're not so fond of them. And we can't convince them either that you know, critical thinking and writing and creative work is actually like a wonderful conduit to like invention. And it's a wonderful conduit to like emotional expression and deepening your rhetoric and uh, deepening your insights into whatever business you want to get into or whatever you want to study. Um, also, it's worthwhile to create art, right? Um, but yeah, I feel like, you know, I honestly feel like they're trying to phase out the uh, graduate program and I, I don't know why because we're like the cheapest program we don't even need anything you know I mean writers we're so underfunded and if you go into Hevelon our school right it's like the worst building and it's full of mold and it's so bad it's so I can't even have office hours there because I'm allergic to mold and uh that's just one example and where I went to school in New Mexico State, um, I think it was Clarabelle Williams Hall was the oldest hall and the most underfunded building. And it was the English building. Like that's just normal. It's normal for academia, you know? It's unfortunate and normal, but I, I hope for better. Like I hope uh, we can make co-op learning centers for writing where writing becomes accessible to everyone. I don't believe in MFA gatekeeping. So it's almost like they're forcing us out anyway. We might have to learn different ways to teach writing and to build up writers. But I don't know, I wanna keep my job. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like um, all over the country, classrooms and educators at higher, in higher education, particularly in the humanities are, are struggling with this. And here, I think we've been fortunate to be able to admit grad students in smaller cohorts. Um, and I think going forward, we'll probably be, we'll, it seems like we'll be admitting smaller cohorts, but with better funding. So taking into account increased financial need, but then as a result, um, scaling down slightly our cohort size. And I will say like, this is definitely the fruit of a few of my colleagues who are extraordinarily nimble um, grant writers and just kind of um, problem solving wizards. And I'm so grateful for that because I think it keeps us able to support the students that we admit. But um, yeah, broadly, I think there is like a really important conversation going on about what is the value of the humanities and what you're describing and sort of a youth mental health crisis, those things are intimately entwined. Um, 
Well, I mean, that's the humanities are the things that does all the stuff we've been talking about in this exactly. episode, you know, can create exactly. ceremony and can talk to teach people how to deal with grief. I mean, what the hell? Yeah, Most writing sense. is about that. Yeah. What? I think, and it's also about creating historical texts, like even the novels we're writing and Louise Erdrich's, I think the sentence, the her most recent, I think it deals with COVID, you know, like things like this are important historical texts and they also do so much, um, they do so much for humanity that it, it's really funny that, uh, you know, education has become more industrialized and also more concerned about, um, creating capital and money, but like, I make more now than I think I would as a business major. Like, I was never going to be a good lawyer. I was never, there are a lot of people who just need, they need to go to school for writing. That's what they're supposed to, you know, and we need to have access to those things because I was never going to be a, a good anything except for a writer or a teacher of writing. We need a home. Give us a home. I agree. I, and I will say on a slightly more optimistic side of that, for our program, Weirdly, the last two years, maybe not weirdly, the last two years that we've seen more applicants than we've ever had. And we've had classes that have been bigger than we've ever been. And we have, I think it's because we had people who are at home thinking, what do I really want to do with my life? And they've said, well, I've always wanted to do this. And maybe now is the time to try to do it. Um, so I hope that Purdue will get its act together and support your program because it's historically been a great and important program in our in our country. And so yeah, I wish you the more, best. It's more diverse now because me and Brian Lung and Sharon, we've been working on making the classes just fuller of um, students who are writing from different perspectives and coming from different you know worlds. And for for us, that's such a gift to because the more diversity in the room, the better the text, like the better the writing always, because people need different perspectives to understand how their work is accepted broadly, you know? And also uh, you learn more culturally, especially, you know, for example, if I'm writing about being indigenous, if I have one other indigenous person in my workshop, my text is gonna be better in that, in that class because they're gonna have insight that, extends beyond um, just kind of a person walking into that culture, not knowing anything. It just is so unfortunate that right now at our most kind of like exciting time, uh, we're kind of being um, cut off in so many ways. And it doesn't feel like a coincidence, but it's also, I'm really trying not to feel discouraged because I mean, I don't know, it seems like with COVID and with what my son's going through at school and all these things, it seems like it's hard to, I feel spread thin with worry. I think everyone does, you know? So it's like, eh. <laughs> well, please say hi to Brian and to I Sharon Solwitz, who's also yeah. a friend who's up yeah, there. Um, it's a great program. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we encourage our listeners to pick up um, a copy of Heartberries if they haven't already. It's a fantastic book. Um, and Teresa, we really appreciate your coming on. All right. Thank you.